Yes, it works. Hope so. Hello, 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 everybody. Please have a seat. We are about to start that session, hopefully in time. Exactly, Vittorio. I'm about to fix this in a second, but I want people to please sit if you can. So I will officially open that session. Thank you for coming in. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us for this uh, open forum, number 38. Um, as it is rightly written on the door, it's about exceptional access in the future of internet security. Well, it will be about encryption in no way. We will discuss consolidation. Um, that was a previous title. OK, it's being removed. It's me on the, on the screen. It's way better. Um, although consolidation is a very important dossier for the Internet Society, but we won't discuss this today. My name is Frederick Dong. I'm the director of the European Regional Bureau. I'm very happy on behalf of the Internet Society to welcome you today, uh, to welcome our community. We have this habit to organize a session where we talk all about our work, about what ISOC is doing. So the conversation of today will be behind this uh, complex title. It will be much about encryption, and you will understand why it is so important for us. Before we get there, I'll have the pleasure um, to introduce Rinalia Abdulhaim, who is our um, Senior Vice President for Strategy Implementation. And I would like you, Rinalia, if you can um, just say a few words about our plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. Good morning, everyone. Have you all had your morning coffee? I hope so. I need you alert for this session. OK, I see smiles and nods. That's good. Um, I'd like to set a bit of context for the session that you're going to have today in terms of what the Internet Society thinks is important. Some of you may have noticed that on Monday, the Internet Society released its action plan for the year 2020. And in this action plan, there are eight projects. It's unheard of for the Internet Society to have projects that are less than 30 in a year. So it's the first time that we're actually focusing. And the reason that we are focusing is because we want to be able to demonstrate our impact. And by focusing, it helps us to be able to concentrate our resources and to show the impact that we have on the internet around the world. In the next six years, between the year 2020 and the year 2025, we will be focused on building a stronger internet and a bigger internet. And in the, inter in the action plan from the eight projects, you will have a sense of what that means. For example, in the, in the bigger internet um, section, you will see efforts or projects like community networks, um, building the capacity of the technical community where it doesn't exist to help deploy infrastructure and expanding infrastructure for the internet through establishing internet exchange points. Between last year and this year, we've established 40 internet exchange points around the, around the world, and about 15 of those are in the region of Africa. So that's just an example of what we're doing on building a bigger internet. The session today is part of the focus on building a stronger internet. And the, some of the key projects under this area include stronger routing security under the MANUS project, or deploying network time security, which doesn't yet exist. And this should concern everyone, because when network time is not secure, your transactions on the internet are not secure, including your financial transactions. So it's not in place yet, and the Internet Society is starting to work on it. Encryption is one of our flagship projects. It's been a focus for a really long time. And end-to-end -end encryption is something that is essential for a stronger internet. And this session will help you understand why. So I wish you all the best, and I ask that you take a look at our action plan, because what we would like to do is to work with everyone to create an internet that is for everyone, that is bigger, enough to cover everyone on the, on the planet, but also stronger to make it secure for everyone as well. Thank you. Over to you, Fred. Thank you, Rinalia. And thank you for this introduction. So we all have the context, um, which lead me to then go into the session in question. Um, so what's the format? You know uh, the format already. We will talk about encryptions, but we will like to hear from you. So expect in 20 minutes 
when we will have shut down the doors so nobody can escape, expect us to ask you to break out in different sessions and feedback us on how you see those issues from your different perspective. So I'm very pleased and honored to have three experts on encryption. I'm telling you, those guys know a lot. Uh, I will introduce them all, and I will ask the first questions. And I will ask them, I know all of them could talk about encryption about hours, and I will ask them to be very short. Um, that would be five, six minutes, so that we have time for the reflection. Starting to introduce Luke Close Landefeld, just sitting next to Rinalia. Close is the vice chair of the board of director of, um, of, Ed, of uh, ECO, the German Association of the Internet Industry, and the director of Frustrated Networks. Thanks for being there, Close. We have Peter Koch, the president of the Internet Society German chapter. Thank you much, uh, Peter. And last but not least, Olaf Korkman, our CTO. Uh, from the Internet Society. And I would like to start with you, Olaf. Um, we will talk about encryption, but what is encryption, please? Gosh, I didn't see that coming. Um, yeah, encryption. Uh, encryption is, in essence, a very, very technical uh, topic when you get down to um, the details of it. But on a high level, it is a methodology to uh, keep our communications uh, when we communicate to our, each other or our data when we store it anywhere confidential, protect its integ integrity, so making sure that it's not being changed and making sure in often case that we can authenticate where our communication comes from. Those three things are very, very important. Confidentially, confidentiality is something that we depend on when going about our daily business in the life of the internet because there are so many other parties that can look at what we're doing when we're on the internet. The internet is a global system and our data goes about the internet um, in, in many, many different ways. Um, when you start your day and you look at your diary, your diary is some, stored somewhere in the cloud. Would you want somebody to look at your diary? Maybe you have nothing to hide, but maybe you have an important uh, 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 appointment that indicates that you're, you know, you're dating or you're uh, meeting with a, with, a, with a bank or you're going to go to a hospital. Um, when data is stored, um, data is stored in the cloud or with a service. Uh, it is very important that that data is encrypted. It's not always the case. And if those data are then stolen, um, what happens then? Well, then you have these big data breaches because everybody can read what your social security number is, your bank account number, your credit card number, your home address, your birthday, all the type of things that you don't want to see stolen. Finally, you know, we have these things. These things are filled with our personal information. What happens if they're stolen? Not only can people, you know, make endless calls uh, on, on, on your bill, but there's so much valuable information. Um, I don't want to lose this because my credit card is in here um, uh, physically, but on the device itself too, there's a lot of information. Um, uh, that, that, that you really don't want to see exposed. The problem in the internet is that um, the attack service on the internet is a global one. That means that anybody from any place in the world can, in essence, uh, attack our conversations or listen to our conversations, um, uh, if, if carefully planned, so to speak. Um, and that is why we, uh, we protect our, our, our systems with encryption. And the way that those systems are designed uh, are such that you cannot trust anybody. Um, that is, um, uh, the design of the system is built such that any party in the system cannot be trusted except the user at the endpoint, except the user who is entrusted with a password or a key or something. The encryption mechanisms are all open and public. 
so that everybody can validate and you don't necessarily have to trust the inventor of this uh, 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 algorithm. No, you can, everybody, every scientist that has a little bit of clue about this can actually assess whether that encryption mechanism is, is valid. The implementations, usually open source, so that you don't have to trust a specific entity that says, yeah, you can trust me. You can trust me, that's okay, uh, nothing to see here. No, you don't have to trust me, you can look yourself. That's what we call a zero trust architecture. Exceptional access is the wish of uh, government uh, uh, entities for access to encrypted communication often for very valid policy reasons, for public safety and so on and so forth. The issue on the internet is that we have not found a way in a zero trust architecture where we do not have to trust on the implementation and the policies around that type of exceptional access introducing somebody else in your conversation without you knowing it. On a global scale, that is very hard to uh, acquire. We don't know, technically, how to do that, how we trust the German government to get into our communication under lawful, you know, uh, uh, lawful uh, 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 protection of, of individuals, and at the same time, not allow any other government to get into our communication because we may not trust the, the, uh, the procedures in that other place. So there is a, both a very real technical question, there is no consensus how you can build this type of architectures in a zero trust architecture, so to speak, how you can build exceptional access, whether it's back doors or front doors, those are all words that fall in this, in this context. It's not possible. People don't know this yet. Well, there are valid policy concerns, I would say. I'm not going to argue that. Um, so that is encryption and exceptional access in a nutshell. And with that, back to... One minute. No, I'm good. I've said what I said. Okay. Well, you're you, you excellent. Thank you. Um, from your perspective, close, um, representing ECO, what is your take on encryption? What is the situation from your perspective? Yes, um, obviously, from an industry perspective, um, encryption has become very important, um, especially since Snowden, since 2013, people are really interested that their data is secure, that data and transfer is secure, um, but also stored data is secure, um, which leads to this interesting quest that, that you have an adversary here, which are states and law enforcement, which is typically not the adversary you're, um, you, you view as an adversary, but it's someone helping to um, bring about security and safety. Um, at least that goes for most countries, I believe. Um, so the discussions we're having right now um, are actually not so much about encryption. That is a bit strange, maybe, but about the question of um, how can it's not a, the question of how can access to data and transfer be arranged, because the data and transfer, the encryption mechanisms, are um, supposedly secure, and are, they are typically are secure, um, which leads to the question, how can I access data before encryption or after a decryption of the data? So access to devices, which um, leads us to the question about how secure are operating systems? Uh, is there an exceptional access to operating systems? Can companies be compelled to, um, to weaken um, their encryption mechanisms or give access to devices which are typically encrypted? We've seen that in the case of um, uh, the FBI versus Apple, for example. Um, uh, but in a lot of countries, there's also a discussion right now about how is access to stored data being arranged? Um, uh, is it allowed that data which is stored with cloud service providers, for example, can that be encrypted um, by the company? 
we always have to differentiate between end-to-end -end security. This is what we've just been introduced to. So should a user arrange security for themselves? Or um, will a company do that for them? Do you rely on a service provider to encrypt data for you and decrypt data or store data securely for you? Um, uh, that is very difficult for industry because typically when we uh, encrypt and store data for you, we can be compelled by governments to actually release that data or decrypt that data. Um, only when encryption is arranged by the users themselves um, it, will it be really secure because you can um, do what is most important with the public, typically public uh, mechanisms and algorithms being used. Uh, the, the, the actual um, strong point of encryption is in the keys, is in, in the secrets being used to encrypt. And uh, you have to do that yourself, store them locally, and only you yourself have to arrange for, for these keys to be, to be held with you, which is incompatible with the know-how um, of most users. Most users do not have um, the technical means, the know-how to do that. So they will rely on companies doing it for them. And that's a paradigm problem um, which we as industry try to, uh, try to solve. Um, and um, most um, security mechanisms on the market right now but by itself are secure, um, will either give you in transit, in storage, um, on your local device, will actually be very safe but we might be compelled to release that data. And that is really the discussion we're having and um, which I would like to um, discuss here as well. Um, what are the positions, what can individuals do to um, further that discussion locally that the real security is about, is, is, is in um, uh, arranging it locally, not having the exceptional access by governments because that is really um, the problem we're having right now. Thank you. Thank you for spotting these questions. It was my question that I was, um, um, well, I was looking forward to ask these questions to the group of people here. Is that clear? Do you have any questions to either Olaf or Close? Because that is a key issue from our perspective. So don't hesitate to just raise your hands if you don't see that clearly. Uh, because yes, as Close said, we would like to discuss that with you. Okay, I, I obviously it's clear. Let's um, go then to you, Peter. Um, I know you had a meeting here in Germany a couple of days ago uh, about this with a lot of different German stakeholders. Can you report back on what happened there? Yeah, thank you, Frederick. And um, indeed, the German chapter had a, uh, an annual event um, just on Sunday, the day minus one of the IGF here in Berlin. Um, where we invited our member, members and the public to a panel session um, to discuss a, uh, the topic of encryption and regulation of encryption and breaking quote quote encryption, although I'll build on what Klaus said when it comes to breaking. Uh, let me say maybe one word that in the German language, um, we don't distinguish between safety and security. We use the same word so as, as some other languages do, which makes mon some discussions uh, a, bit, a bit more complicated. Uh, well, that's the German part, of course. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm, I'm probably missing the punchline when I translate uh, what the topic of the session was, but it's, it's more safety by less cryptography. That's what the, the theme of the session was. And the, um, this goes back to what, uh, what Olaf said. What are we talking about today when we talk about breaking encryption? Let me go back a bit in history, maybe. So, um, Olaf already explained that this is very technical and without going into details, um, we do have encryption algorithms and encryption schemes and some are weaker than others and some are better than others. And then we usually use keys of a, of a different strength. And back in the day um, when this encryption was invented, there were, very early on, there were um, perceptions of danger of having encrypted communication because, yes, governments or military or other interested parties couldn't um, listen in. Well, they could listen in on cables still, but they would just get garbled information. Um, and what happened was that there were export restrictions on this. You could only export software that would use keys of a length that uh, hopefully the criminal around the corner would not be able to break, but the state actor would be able to break. 
um, that went away um, because, of course, in uh, international trade and communications, it is important to um, protect the end-to-end, -end, again, uh, communication between parties against a variety of, of actors. And actually using wikis would also give um, access to unintended parties, not the state actors, but maybe the uh, criminal organization that is a bit more equipped or that has the support of another state actor and the resources and so on and so forth. So we're beyond that. And then when people talk about breaking encryption, there's sometimes the idea that this, the, the scheme itself could be broken. And there is a, an arms race, of course, between people who develop the encryption algorithms and people who try to break them. And actually, the people who try to break these algorithms, they are very, very important because they, le they deliver um, the, the uh, peer review, so to speak, of the public scrutiny on the strength of the algorithms. Most of them are considered secure because researchers in transparent processes all over the world weren't able to break them. Um, over a long period of time. That's what we rely on. And then there is some mathematical and computer science information theory behind why we think they are strong, but this is something that is, is very much founded in scientific, um, scientific evidence or scientific practice, I should say. Which means that the idea that we could yeah, break the, the scheme that is in theory still possible and then once in a while you find news articles where people say that they broke something. That might be the case when it comes to older algorithms um, but not the ones today. So when, again, people talk about breaking encryption, it's not so much about attacking the, the mathematics behind it. It is about finding other doors into the encrypted channel. That is either, it is like, if, you, if you're in a secure tunnel, then you're fine, but then you need to get into the tunnel at one end and you might want to get out of the tunnel at the other end. If the enemy, quote, quote, is at either end, they can, of course, whatever you do in, this, in that secure tunnel, at the end they will catch you. And this is also what happens um, with, with encryption. Now, what can be done? You can dig holes into tunnels. Um, this is uh, like getting in. Um, and uh, that, that's one idea, that the, uh, the encryption could be uh, intercept well, not intercepted, but you could mimic somebody. Uh, you could mimic the real end of the tunnel and instead be a party that should not be part of the conversation. That's one, one part that is uh, thought about and that Olaf mentioned that already. How could we um, forge the recipient? Because this whole security thing is not only about the encryption, the confidentiality of the communication, What's very important is that you are very, very certain that you're talking to the right partner on the other side and that you're talking only to that partner and not some other party that is in that encryption, unless, of course, you intend to do, to talk to, um, to communicate with a number of uh, uh, partners at the same time. Um, so the undetected addition, undetected uh, addition of um, able recipients is, is what is, when, when people talk about uh, breaking the encryption, which is a misnomer a bit, but we need to live with that. Um, and that's what, uh, what much of the um, ideas are. So we had a member of parliament from the opposition party, from one of the opposition parties, I should say. We had Klaus on the panel. Um, we unfortunately, and really that person had to bail out on, on the very last minute, we would love to have a person from the Ministry of the Interior who is in charge of the cyber capabilities. Um, so we had uh, to go a bit around that. And we had somebody uh, uh, from, from data protection and really a, a scientist in, in criminal research. One of the claims that was brought forward is uh, one of the claims of um, state authorities and others is that, yeah, everybody's going dark through encryption. Terrorists and criminals use encryption. They drink water and they eat bread. With the encryption, of course, all the capabilities of this untempered communication is also available to those uh, criminals and other bad actors. That's true. Um, the claim is that authorities are going dark. And one, uh, the, the researcher made that remark that that is very, a very narrow view in this uh, whole scenario because in addition to encryption, 
Law enforcement today has a lot of other opportunities. Olaf showed you his smartphone. And you know what? When that is seized, under certain circumstances, information can be gathered. There is access to lots of chat logs that is, that is available that wasn't available to law enforcement like 25 years ago um, because not everybody took written notes from their site conversation in some spooky corner of the city. This is what happens today, right? So that's, that's one important point to look at the overall balance. What additional information does IT and communication deliver that wasn't pr um, present before? And that needs to be balanced and compared with what additional can be, uh, can be hidden by, by encryption and encrypted communication. So that's, that's one takeaway. And uh, the other is, probably that these exceptional circumstances and the regulation are very difficult. The technology is very, very much intent neutral. The cryptographic scheme doesn't know whether you are communicating your bank details or whether in that encrypted stream there's your plan to rob your bank or maybe another bank, but anyway. Um, that, that is not, that is not to, to decide for that scheme, and it, of course it cannot be decided from the outside because it's all encrypted. Now you can have somebody who is a suspect, and that's the thing where, 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 the, where it gets technically interesting. So what to do? We're not talking about mass surveillance here, that's another story, but if we have a suspect or a limited number of suspects, what is available then? How could this addition uh, of, a, uh, of, of an additional, additional hidden recipient, how could that work? And that's maybe where the discussion is, is going to go in, uh, on, a, on a technical level. And I think I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Peter, thank you. I appreciate that all three experts have taken three different angles. So you have a very whole view of uh, encryption issues. Um, so, Back to the, to the session, actually back to you. So um, my colleagues, they know who they are, will help me um, for the breaking sessions. And we have the luck also to have each of our experts coming to one of the three groups. So let's constitute three groups. We're very easy. We are having three parts of the room. So one group, another group, and a third group. Please, colleagues, if you can stand up and help us to gather all the people herding cats and having those three groups defining who will be reporting. The questions that you may ask yourself, of course, are the situation in your respective country. Do you see uh, encryption or the threat? What are the reasoning that are being uh, expressed for encryptions to be broken in your country? Do you have any perspective on this? Uh, this is also to help us uh, better promoting uh, what we just discussed. So how could we improve the narrative about um, the importance of encryption? Uh, what is your role? How do you see your own role with your own respective community when you get back home? Those are the different issues that we would invite you to discuss, plus any other, plus questions that you may have. Um, all the three speakers spoke about the importance of not only backdoors, but up doors that uh, governments might just build, um, ghost users, what not mentioned, but this is one of the tricks that some governments may be willing to find. We will be happy to answer any questions that you may, you may have. So with this in mind, I see Raquel is already uh, in order. Please gather people. I see Raquel there. We have Leah over there, and we have Jiran here behind me, could we please try to have three equal groups to work on? And then I will ask Olaf and you, Peter, and you, Klaus, to just uh, meet those groups and discuss with them. Thank you very much. Raquel, you can take a mic and speak. I will. So thank you, Frederick. Uh, the fellows who are also going to help, please, if you can spread into the groups and come over. Thank you.
Okay, okay. Five minutes, everybody. Five minutes. Thank you. One minute, time for conclusion, please. One minute.
Sorry, ma'am. Can I give you one microphone? Oh, yeah. This there you is go. Uh, and you just also introduce yourself. And sure. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm the party pooper. I will have to interrupt you. I will ask um, each of the group would receive the microphone. And I will ask each of you in each group to uh, take the lead and report back. I'm sorry, uh, it's always the same. It's very painful to interrupt you. I apologize for this, but that's how it works. It's nearly one o'clock and we will be expelled from this room. So stay where you are. The microphone come to your group and I will ask each of the group to report back. Please, who want to start by way of hand? Turning. Jiren, your group, could you please stand up? Could I have your attention? Please stay where you are. It's okay. And listen to each other. Please. Group of Siren, please go. Introduce yourself and please report. Hello. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Louis. I'm from the ISOC Youth Ambassador. I was tasked to report on the discussion that my group uh, has had, and it was a very fruitful discussion. Um, we spoke about, uh, firstly, that there must be more con uh, conversations on decentralizations, on dark webs, blockchains, and etc., and not purely focusing on encryption. Um, and the other thing that we discussed was that it is also important to know that to allow an exceptional access would mean to create an opportunity not only for the law enforcers to use, but also a potential uh, a space for the bad actors to abuse. And therefore, when we design an encryption, we must, uh, a recommendation is to remove as any need of trust of uh, uh, users using uh, that technology uh, in good faith, because if you allow an uh, exceptional access, it's always open to uh, malefic, uh, bad actors to abuse. Um, We've also spoke about the importance of raising awareness and humanizing the dialogue in uh, regards to uh, encryption and allow both uh, lawmakers and uh, users of this technology to know the importance uh, of this encryption and at the same time the, the, uh, the potential cons or the uh, adverse effects of having uh, exceptional access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And make sure that you share those conclusions with uh, Jaren, uh, who has led the group with you, because we will take that on board. Thank you very much. Second group, Leah, your group. Could you please report back from your group, Leah? Who is in charge? Hello, everyone. Thank you. Introduce yourself, please. I am hearing from the ISDOC IG of Youth Ambassadors. Um, in our group, we talk about the importance of encryption the role of the government about it, what are the issues uh, around per, uh, personal countries, where people are more easy to speak, company have to have a more secure um, structure about the data, and also they have to have a law protection, um, according to the Australia. Local perspective about encryption can be different. So on the other end, we have the personal rights, and on the other end, we have the to protecting the rights. We, we also talked about the law enforcement, precisely about um, Switzerland. And also there are some RNS, but it's still, we are still dealing with some issues. We, we made a verses about the privacy and the enforcement, and we need to let the government bring encryption when it needs to be done. We also talked about the how to promote the law in protection and how to implement it. Not also to just bring it, but also to implement it so every every um, citizen can understand what is their encryption, what is important for them. We also talked about uh, how people should know their their rights to speak one to one. So someone to from Facebook said that, and it was really important. We talked also about open policies, and we, we realize that we need bigger debates on v values when it comes to encryption, privacy, and security. And we talked also about the socializing laws, and we talked also about the Congo, where we need to have more um, human rights about privacy, what is important to have it. 
And in other hand, we, we, we realized that it is not only to have inclusion, but it's also about to be secure and every citizen can understand on a national and an international level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leah, make sure we have those conclusions as well. Turning to you, Raquel, who is from your group is reporting, please. Hello. The floor is yours. Hi, uh, so we had a very fruitful discussion on encryption and why it matters. And the starting inception point uh, on which we uh, dwelled upon was why citizens caring at, uh, uh, about encryption should uh, think about to strike the right balance between uh, privacy and security. And one of the suggestions that our group thought of was a, maybe a spiral uh, development framework to reinforce the rule of law and maintain the dichotomy of privacy and security, which can go a long way in ensuring that uh, encryption is done. Then we had comments from uh, various uh, participants like uh, regarding the backup services infrastructure or backup of data and what problem and what implications it would have for vulnerability groups like uh, youth, women, and marginalized groups, and how the importance of data uh, could yield to awareness uh, of encryption in the future. Then uh, there was discussion about uh, how not only awareness is important, but encryption is a very broad spectrum, and it needs to be understood from various viewpoints of a multi-stakeholder uh, policy group uh, from the point of view of a technologist or uh, an economist or an uh, uh, maybe academician. So we need to have all communities in common to you know, build the future technology and leverage platforms to integrate solutions to make data more informative, more, more accessible, and more encrypted. How controlled access of data can yield to end end-to-end -end point uh, encryption was also discussed. And there were solutions, uh, you know, which were proposed by the group to, uh, to foster the encryption uh, in the internet ecosystem and, uh, and ma make sure that a proactive approach is uh, taken both by the government and the stakeholders and the end users and the companies and uh, make sure that encryption is a viable thing in the future as well. Then there, there was a very good point this uh, lady mentioned about the distrust in government in some parts and how to like ensure that there is balance between companies, users, and government's access to information. We touched upon risk points in the process of in, in encryption. And uh, the solution that we came up with was how internet education, especially encryption in curriculum, can go a long way in teaching about what basically encryption is uh, uh, from a technological point of view to a policymaker so that he makes better laws for it. And uh, lastly, we had a comment from uh, Kenya, one of the participants from Kenya, Africa, in the context of a developing nation, that how security of public loss keeping regulation for access to information is sometimes uh, uh, leads to confusion as to how to make an informed choice about which platform to use. So we dwelled upon these uh, various touch points, and it was a very fruitful discussion I have. I'm still I'm thinking about solutions. It was a very limited time, I would say. So I would request the participants uh, or the IGF committee to have give us more time, maybe in Poland next year, <laughs> to take this forward discussion. And uh, yes, so these are some of the solutions we touched upon, and we look forward to further deliberations of the conference. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah, so applause to all of you. You, you. you realize what we are able to do in just 20 minutes, and I agree with the last speaker. I would love to continue this conversation. The good news is that these conversations will continue. As Rinalia said, um, uh, please check our 2020 plan that has just been released, in which you will see that encryption is one of the key projects that ISOC will endeavor, hopefully with you, in the next coming weeks, months, and years. So uh, thanks a million for your participations. Um, so sorry that we have to interrupt, but we can uh, continue discussing this around uh, during the lunch or wherever you meet. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers close uh, you, Peter, Olaf, just disappear, and my colleague from IVOC who helped organize these sessions. And thanks to you, the, this meeting is ended. Thank you very much again. Bye.